Good afternoon folks and welcome back to another Monday afternoon sofa safari. My name's Brad, we've got Stu on the camera today, Trevor on the tracker seat, Janine on comms on the first team and we've got Ryan and Tom on the second team. Um, yeah, so welcome back. Um, looking forward to getting started. We're out the vehicle, I just wanted to actually show you folks something here that we've spotted. Um, just before we begin, just a reminder to swap over when we do uh, to the other team and please feel free to ask any questions as we, as we go along. All right, let's have a look what we've got here. The buffalo skull, just the remnants of it at least. You can see most of most of the skulls actually kind of gnawed away or kind of uh, you know over time has just deteriorated. A little chunk over here that's split off recently and it's cracked off for some reason. And you can actually see now the inner the inner workings of the horn. That's that uh, core of, of bone, and then you've got the, the sheath of keratin surrounding it. It's a nice example. Over here, you can see all these little holes dotted around. Um, there's actually uh, an insect um, that'll take advantage of this. You know, you think that's the end now with this buffalo skull, but there's still a lot of uh, material here that some of the other animals might use. Um, this particular insect is actually uh, called the horn moth. It uh, pretty much only feeds on, on dead animals' keratin. On the, on the sheath, it has to be dead. Uh, you can see this is the little bore, boring holes where they've come in. Um, very rarely ever spot the adults, the, the moths themselves. Um, but yeah, occasionally you might see them on horns or they are attracted to light uh, in some places. Yeah, so this little uh, larva is, uh, well, the, the moth itself is a relative of the clothes moth family. So they can, you know, survive on this very tough keratin, much like hair really. Um, and then once they're, they're ready, you'll see on the, on the base of this skull, much better example here. Once they've kind of eaten, so let's get the light on there. Can you see that? Come and got some, some fecal matter over here. I'll just rip that up. This is old entrance tunnels, exit tunnels rather, I should say, because when they are done eating, they'll reverse out of these little uh, tunnels and they'll pupate. I don't see any any like pupa that I can show you. Wait, here's one. Yeah, I broke it. <laughs> but yeah, they, you can see these very long ones. That's pretty much the length that it can reach uh, before they're ready to pupate. At the moment, most of these insects are in resting phases or in dire pause, waiting for the seasons to change. Temperature changes uh, will trigger, you know, um, their, their kind of activity again and the, the daylight um, you know the hours also trigger that so some of them will be resting and then some of them will be in what we call a diapause which is a very fixed resting phase these guys are probably pupating at the moment in here in their resting phase uh, waiting for the season to change and then they'll start getting active again i'll just put them back there yeah so nothing much goes to waste eh? and even on the skull itself you can see this is fairly easy to remove I'm sure a lot of animals like uh, warthogs, impalas, kudus, um, you know, some other animals that you least expect have been gnawing on this for some, some calcium, um, particularly around winter times, um, you know, lacking their um, nutri nutrition and their minerals in, in the leaves and the foliage. They start to try and get it from other sources and osteophagia is what we call it when they go for the bones, uh, but they'll also eat soil and things like that uh, in some places some sodic sites and things to get maybe some minerals um, just to kind of make up for that loss yeah so not much goes to waste i've even seen some warthogs using this as a little scratching post <laughs> all right so let's get started eh? afternoon everybody hope you're all doing well Hope you enjoyed the information about our buffalo in retirement there. Um, <laughs> let's head out and go see what else we can find. Let's head round there, bud. Cool. I think we'll drive the, drive the dry riverbed, eh? Yeah, this time of the day is always nice down in the riverbeds. Let's see what we can find down there. Actually 
some tracks here. Mad buffalo going in that direction. Nice. Right? nice. <laughs> buffalo activity around the, the dry riverbeds and also around the perennial river up by the sand river. A lot of the grasses of course are staying a little bit more lush um, still even this time of the year. Quite thick terrain so also quite dangerous for us to be walking around at this uh, time of the year in these areas. But let's see maybe we get lucky and they could be close to the road or something. Very fresh drop in here. Man. Fresh? It's <laughs> a bonus. Wow. Fantastic. Nice, got four nice big bull buffaloes. Always look at you like there's um, either they owe you, you owe them money or um, they don't always seem to have this way of looking at you and being a little bit more grumpy than normal. So, um, often you get these small groups of males, um, generally buffalo are found in really nice big herds. And what tends to happen in these bachelor groups is that where a male buffalo walks in the herd is, depends on his fighting ability. So if he's a really big bull and can fight well, he'll walk towards the front with the female pathfinders. And if you have less of a fighting ability, you'll end up walking at the back. A little bit of confrontation there. I think the one on the left there is um, definitely uh, doesn't have much chance just looking at his size. <laughs> But then you find these bachelor groups forming when they don't keep up with the herds or can compete with the really big bulls. And they small these, form these um, unstable bachelor groups, really for a survival strategy. And as Brad was mentioning, you know, around the riverbeds, more lush grass, more water available tend to favor these areas this time of the year and yes even though they may look a little bit docile this is one animal that we have huge respect for particularly when we're tracking in these areas we want to make sure that we are safe they tend to not take any have um, best described as a thousand kilograms of attitude so we uh, generally give them extra respect they gen generally will test your climbing ability if you <laughs> disrespect them while you're walking but as you can see their power the shoulders the neck Incredibly powerful animal. So in evolutionary terms, this is the product of what cows become in the presence of lions. <laughs> Pretty much cows with anger management issues. on steroids.
folks, we've um, just got word from our other team. Um, they've got something special that they want, would like to show you. I don't know if things are changing at the moment, so we're going to swap over to them. Um, just remember to, of course, swap over when we do. Tom, Right, good afternoon guys. Um, just a little moment of, of silence there, obviously, as we've, we've taken across from our self-proclaimed first team. Um, we'll have to put that to a, a vote a little bit later, but for now, uh, we've got something quite interesting unfolding here. You can see getting a bit of movement out of our, uh, one of our female leopards called Basile. Um, now, the reason we've taken over a bit prematurely is we've got a hyena that's just moved in, a very young hyena. Um, but moved in and is now circling this termite mound here. So just trying to have a look at what we've seen. Um, this hyena definitely spotted us and, and might not have even seen this leopardess yet. So we're gonna we're gonna see what happens. Um, we'll keep watching. As you can see, she's she's completely alert. She knows the hyenas here. Um, she's got a perfect escape route in this uh, in this uh, boer bean tree next to her. And um, of course, that's uh, there goes the hyena. It's moving off. Don't know if you, you guys might just see it through there. Can you see it, right? Okay. So yeah, just uh, just another day in her in her office. She's uh, seen that off without any issues. 
um, completely confident in her, her own ability to, you know, to escape, get up this tree here um, and uh, maybe, you know, out, out compete that particular individual. It was quite a small kind of young hyena. Um, but just very cool to see that that calm reaction from this this female. So once again, just showing that that pure confidence that uh, that she has, you know, just from her years of uh, of experience out here. So um, yeah, guys, just uh, sitting with myself, Tom, and and Ryan behind the camera. Um, as you can see, we, we've actually changed things up a little bit, trying to get a, a slightly different perspective. Um, and we are minus one. We're we're missing Brandon. Um, we finally finally got rid of him. But uh, no, all, all jokes aside, he is, he is missing. We're not sure where he is. Um, it might be a, a where's Brandon afternoon, but we'll, we'll just see how it goes. Um, but yeah, for now, just myself and Ryan. Ryan's obviously going to be checking out your guys' questions there and, and interacting a bit more than the normal, you know, the guy behind the camera. Um, and yeah, we'll just sit with her for a few more minutes. We, um, we did get very lucky with her today. We, we spent quite a lot of time tracking her this morning. Um, her position was actually called out to us by a troop of monkeys, which was, which was quite incredible to see. You know, one of those valuable clues that, that uh, alerts us to the position of a predator. So the monkeys alarm call and, and give us the location. We move in and we, we manage to find her, uh, but not her alone. Also her, her, um, her cub. Uh, the little male cub um, and he's at this stage he's, he's a little bit shy with the vehicles um, when we were sitting with her earlier well the other team we, we just had a bit of a handover the um, this young cub moved off a little bit so we're not too sure where he is at this stage he might pop out at any second uh, but for now we've just got mom sitting beautifully here in the uh, in the afternoon light on this termite mound And of course, many of you guys, you've started to kind of um, catch on to the, the lineage of, of our different leopards out here, the leopard population. This is a female who we have showcased before her and her cub as well. Um, the Basile female, as I mentioned, the daughter of Tangisa, who's another very prominent female um, within our Western sector here, a little bit further north. Um, and this is pretty much one of the more kind of central areas on the Western sector. And Basile has, has kind of set up shop here. She's taken control and she's been fairly fairly successful over the last few years that she's been here um i think this is this so far is is a first surviving litter she's she's already tried a few times with with certain cubs uh, we'll touch touch wood there quickly just to give her a bit of luck with this one um but unfortunately that's that's generally how it goes with with young leopards is um it, it's often down to trial and error so we see them you know try figure things out with their their new cubs um, there's many many elements of danger out here for the youngsters so very normal to see them losing cubs in the early years and um, of course now she's she's gone through a few litters I think what is this right her fourth litter I think it should be her fourth litter fourth litter <clears throat> yeah so she I mean they're just you know that's that's the proof that she's tried a few things and uh, as I say this is the longest she's she's managed to keep a, cu a cub alive so uh, we, we just hope that that keeps going and um, yeah very cool to just have seen her grow over the last few years and and improve the way she does things. Incredible to see um, that coat in in kind of action. I guess you could say they're just completely blending, blending her into her surroundings. Um, those lovely rosettes with all the irregular kind of spot patterns all over it, and the the varied coloration in the coat just makes her completely disappear in the leaf litter in the grass there. Um, and of course, that is one of the the elements or characteristics which makes her extremely successful out here is is that ability to just completely disappear. Um, so I mentioned that we, we managed to find her and her cub this morning. 
and uh, probably within about five minutes of, of finding her on foot getting a vehicle in to come and try and kind of keep up with her um, we, we lost her and, and just like that you know many people refer to leopards as a, as a golden hallucination they've got this ability to be there one second and, and you know a second later just disappear so it's, it's fascinating to see how when when that coat is, is really kind of utilized, um, they can completely disappear. And if they don't want to be found, they won't be found. Um, so yeah, we were lucky, uh, or I wouldn't say lucky, but with a bit of persistence, we came out again um, and managed to track her down a, a second time. And uh, now, we, now we sit with her. But of course, she'll, she'll use that element of, of uh, camouflage and, and um, you know, secrecy to, to thrive out here in order to successfully sneak up on, on prey. Um, she's what we would refer to as an ambush predator. So she has to sneak up nice and close to, to whatever her quarry might be. Um, you know, sometimes as close as 5 meters, 10 meters, probably 15 meters at the max. And um, from there she should be able to be successful with that, with that element of surprise. You know, just catching the, the animal off guard. Um, and managing to to kind of take it down whereas we we obviously see other predators out here like the the painted wolves or the wild dogs for example who are endurance hunters um, where they can actually run an animal down and and rather than using um, that guile and, and secretive approach they they just go all out and, and flush animals out um, and they can chase them down as I say but most of the uh, most of the cats out here the leopards the lions specifically they are uh, ambush predators and she's a, she's a master of that, as we've said. I think that's something people often ask us with the cats when, we, when we're sitting with lions and leopards and they approach a herd of impala or a herd of zebra. Everybody immediately expects the animals to, to run away or the lion to, to simply stroll over and pull one of them down where people forget how difficult it is to actually catch those animals. Now the lions and the leopards pretty much outwit them, outthink them, hide from them yeah. <laughs> to, get, to get them. Um, no, it's not an easy thing here. Huh? And uh, yeah, they become masters of it. Yeah, they become ninjas almost. Yes, yeah, they have to. Uh, they have to yeah. Yeah, disappearing into their environment, it's, it's, it's crazy to watch and see. Yeah, and that's uh, obviously just a result of, you know, um, millennia you know huge amount of time of, of um, evolving um, side by side you know predators and prey um, always trying to outwit the opposite and, and outdo the opposite in order to be successful um, and that's why we see this this in incredible diversity and, and all these different capabilities and, and abilities that stem from those years of, of just figuring each other out you know be all being kind of interconnected and um, it's it's this network of of interrelationships that that have formed what we see today so um yeah even just that that little incident no i wouldn't call it an incident but the uh little meeting we had there with a hyena coming across you know as we said that's that stems from an, an age-old rivalry between two competing predator species um and uh, there's times that that it could turn into something a little bit more if if this leopard had food here that hyena would definitely be hanging around waiting to I mean, the, the hyena would definitely be waiting around for some of the scraps you know if she had to go up and feed but um because there's no food here that hyena doesn't necessarily see the leopard as, as a viable food option at this stage especially that particular hyena being quite small um so he's he's moved off you know everybody's happy leopard's happy hyena's happy um nobody gets hurt but uh yeah just interesting to see how how in certain scenarios things can be different I think uh, just to answer two questions into one, um, the guys have asked if Ravenscourt is the father of the cub, mm. so that would be correct. Ravenscourt is the father of this cub. Uh, and then the second is, where is he? And have we heard anything about him? Um, and we were, Tom and I were actually just discussing this, and he, he's been quite an elusive chap. Um, we have managed to bump into him uh, once or twice uh, on the off, off over the last couple of weeks. Um, but it never seems to be on a Monday afternoon, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but he, he, he seems to be around uh, doing huge distances as he does. 
um, and so a little bit more difficult to keep track of him. Um, but I see the guys asking about day one as well. Um, we, we haven't had any sign of day one since last week yes. um, when you guys saw him on the, with the other team. Um, since then, no, no further sign on day one. Yeah, and that, that in itself is, is very kind of interesting when we look at the, the population dynamics. Um, Ravenscourt, as far as his, his territory size, you know, you, you might look at it from, from the outside and think he's, he's an extremely successful leopard, um, dominant male leopard. But from a biological point of view, he, he, you know, he hasn't had too many successful offspring. Now he's, he's getting the ball rolling a little bit. But um, the downside to having such a, a huge expansive territory is it's very difficult to manage. So we're seeing the likes of the day one male, Misava, Euphorbia, all of these young males that are pushing in and, and kind of spending too much time in, in a territory which is not theirs. Um, and of course, they, 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 and they often cause chaos. You know, they're, they're killing off um, young cubs that are not their own. Um, harassing females in, in certain cases and um, yeah it's it's just means that uh, Ravenscourt might need to downsize a little bit in order to become truly biologically successful to get that uh, the reproduction going and and uh, obviously pass his genetics down efficiently uh, because at this stage of course he's got the large territory he's having loads of cubs but the survival rate is, is not very high um, so it it kind of counteracts all that hard hard work that he's that he's putting in, um, but yeah, it's he's one of the most beautiful male leopards out here. He's he's really really as as we've called him before our golden boy. You know he's he's a very impressive specimen, um, but as Ryan said, yeah, he's just been quite scarce recently. Um, we see tracks of him every now and again, but uh, more more like an apparition these days. All right, just to answer a couple of questions that have come through again. Um, one, uh, male leopards uh, obviously spend very little time uh, with their cubs. Uh, there have been cases where there's been interactions and uh, even males playing with their cubs and, uh, and feeding with the cubs, um, but they don't hang around with the females like male lions do. And so a lot of the time when the little ones are in trouble, uh, dad will be nowhere near them. Um, and, and so it would be mom that would have to try and protect them. But with male leopards, um, dad inadvertently protects the youngsters by keeping the territory safe, by keeping his territory safe and keeping young males and old nomadic males out. Uh, he protects the cubs. Uh, and that's what Tom is saying is Raven's courts problem at the moment. His territory is too large and he's doing too big a distance uh, to do that successfully. So the younger males are managing to sidestep and dodge and weave him. Uh, day one is doing the same. Um, uh, and so it's, it's costing him uh, in that way. If he had a smaller territory, uh, maybe less females, and, and he concentrated more of his energy in those areas, made his presence more feeling uh, by the younger males, they'd keep out and so he'd protect them in that way. All right, guys. So um, I think what we what we are gonna do is um, obviously she's not really up to much, so that's it's not very exciting. Nice to see her, of course, and at least we had the head up in the beginning. Um, but we might just go do a little loop through the area here, see if there's there's any sign of of her cub. Um, the other guys have just been in in touch with us on the radio. They have got something to show you. Um, so yeah, we're gonna hand over to them. We might try and find uh, Brandon while we're at it as well. 
um and uh, yeah i think we'll we'll just see how it goes hopefully if we don't see you have a lovely week and uh, yeah all the best from uh, from us here uh, on the the a team we'll 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 take that one <laughs> have a good week everybody <laughs> okay guys you can take over when you're ready happy thank you changing now I don't know if you guys, uh, if you heard that, sorry, we're just giving the, uh, the other team a little bit of time there, but um, yeah, I'm not sure if you heard those, those birds flapping through the tree, through the canopy above her, um, but amazing to see how that, you know, warranted absolutely no reaction from her. So incredible to see how in tune she is. She knows exactly what's dangerous, what's not. Um, and uh, that's, you know, sitting here right next to her, it just proves that, that trust in us, in the vehicle, in our voices, um, she knows we, we mean her no harm in any way and um, it's, it's a level of habituation which obviously has, has come around over many, many decades of, uh, of working with these leopards and um, obviously all the other animals in particular also. But um, yeah, really, really cool to, to know that we've, we've almost regained that, that mutual trust um, and it allows us to, to see them doing exactly what they would be doing if we weren't here. So um, as you can see, she hasn't, you know, even batted an eyelid at us, which is very cool. Just another day in her office. And uh, being a cat, being a, a leopard, majority of, of her day obviously is, is spent doing exactly this. Basilia and her cub still alive and well. While well, she's been busy there, we managed to find some, some elephants. A lovely female here, close to the vehicle. There's actually quite a few more up ahead. Yeah, that left fin sort of staring at us, he's hiding a little bit. Let's see, maybe those others are more visible. Yeah. They've been in the mud again during the heat of the day, cooling themselves down. Nice and relaxed. There it goes. Possibly about a five or six year old, you can see the tusks just starting to come out. That's generally how we age them, and then they're fully weaned around that age when we start seeing that tusk. But you can just pause here, there's some lovely life here on this new life. Beautiful life. 
glass on her. You can see the mud also on her back. Nice warm day we had today. The days are slightly getting longer, of course. You can see their meticulous feeding habits um, when they do feed, especially the grass. You'll often see them shaking the grass if they get a bit of roots to get that sand off. Um, the elephant's teeth are very important, of course, to them. Uh, they only get six sets throughout their whole life, so they have to be careful. You know, if they wear them down too fast, so of course removing that sand is also going to aid them in alleviating that problem. You see the youngster in the front here doing it, pulling it up, shaking the roots off, or even just biting the root tip off. You can see there. There we go, to follow his line. We just noticed on your previous um, questions, everybody's very worried about Brandon. Which we still don't know why, but I'm joking. <laughs> Brandon is perfectly fine. He's well. He's on a serious tracking mission today. He's been helping tracking. So he's, he's out here and he's helping and still very much a part of the team. So he's all good. We'll put his uh, mug back on the camera next week. What's quite interesting for you guys, uh, Brad mentioned that the, the days are warming up and it's getting quite hot. We can hear in the trees around us. You may even pick up the sounds of the insects and the bees. A lot of the trees are actually starting to... Um, pollinate now um, which is early signs of spring which is all very exciting for us um, coming towards you know August September when the seasons are starting to change found one of those spike thorns That's on the nice. spike thorn mainly and then a bit on the quarry bush oh, yeah. go up ahead you have, have a look there yeah let's get the light on the mountain might actually pick up the noise even of the, the insects flying around See just on the left of us here, a very nice bright green tree here. We call the red spike thorn. You can see the flowers starting to show, attracting quite a lot of insects that are active in their resting phases. If you, if you folks heard that with all the elephant uh, activity here, yeah, it's a little bit tricky. <laughs> around you actually must be quite a large group uh, most of them not visible in the tree line you can see a few a few bums quite a characteristic tear in this particular individual's ear it would be quite a diagnostic feature for us to recognize her again that's one of the ways that we um, tell individuals apart tusks as well as the ears any kind of abnormal markings maybe that maybe scar tissue or anything like that um, but of course our elephants move freely within the greater system so uh, we do get herds coming and going could be several months before they return The question here relating to the um, well to the discussion you were just having on the insects, um, but this is regarding mosquitoes and whether it is a problem at Ulusaba or not. Um, we we do have malaria, uh, very low risk malaria in this particular area. Of course, sorry, yeah, the mosquitoes can be a problem there. 
uh, we are quite far on the on the um, on the on the western side of Kruger, so more east is getting a little bit more high risk, uh, more towards Mozambique side. Um, so we don't have too much issues, but there has been in the past some recorded cases of, of malaria. Uh, at the moment, there's not many mosquitoes now because there's not much water. Um, but once the first rains usually start, of course, then they'll start breeding again and we should, we should see quite a bit more mosquitoes. Well, as the, the malaria topic and that, um, we, you know, at the lodges and, and all around, we all have um, special spraying and everything done to prevent the mosquitoes. Um, we also encourage our guests when they travel, uh, once they've gone to travel clinics and that, to take the prophylactic that the doctors prescribe. Uh, just a precautionary measure. And as Brad mentioned, further east you go towards the Mozambique uh, side is where malaria becomes more of a problem. So we do get mosquitoes. However, we put all the preventative measures in place. Beautiful light on that tree, Mark. I don't know if the camera will pick this up, but from this particular angle, you can see the hairs on the back, especially around the rump. Uh, not many people know that elephants' bodies are covered in hair. You don't really see it when you look at them at first glance, but it may be against the backdrop of the sky or with the light shining at a particular angle, you'll see it. Uh, it's very, very uh, stiff, almost like, like steel wool. Very strong hairs, of course, they also help hold, cling the mud to their bodies and uh, very characteristic, of course, of mammals. can have a look at and just something um, for the folks at home and viewers that have never been on safari before you notice with that female elephant how her body language she was relaxed she had no issue coming that close to the vehicle purely being that she decided to approach us Brad parked in a perfect spot in that um, she chose a direction we didn't block her path and that's what makes sighting so incredibly special and for us to be able to relax and enjoy seeing these lovely big animals from so close there's a perfect example um, of watching animals body language you could see that she wasn't aggressive she was relaxed she approached the vehicle which allowed us to get such a fantastic sighting there big leadwood trees in this um, little flood plain over here. Where is it? Okay. Dave's got some audio for some more elephants up ahead. We're gonna go quickly have a look there. <coughs> 
I have a question regarding Safari Lodge um, and the dam, the water hole at Safari Lodge and how is it looking this dry winter season and if the hippos are there or not? No hippos, they're still definitely watering the dam and looking good and you know heat of the day we see lots of general going down there um, and with our new system um, of draining water in there it's working really well. Youngsters playing up the water. But yes, there is definitely water still in the dam, and you know, when guests come back this time of the year to sit at the treehouse and enjoy the animals midday is fantastic. Got two youngsters here having a possibly a family dispute. Another one. Very small. baby elephant on the right beautiful little guy Not really doing much at this age, mostly just watching mom and figuring things out, playing with stuff. And the trunk is the most difficult muscle to, to you know, get used to. It takes them roughly about a year to actually work out the, the use of their trunk. About 60,000 muscles in their trunks, individual muscles. Quite a lot of uh, control. Very dexterous. Occasionally you can feel the little little guy's frustration when he's trying to get one leaf into his mouth and fails. guys were asking about Brandon and what Brandon's up to. We struggle to lie to you guys. So Brandon's been working very hard on female leopard tracks that we think is Tlangisa. We obviously, as what you guys are, these last couple of months have been very, so, so worried or concerned about her. But we've had tracks and Brandon's been working on them for the last few hours while we've been on safari. So we're going to have one more last look at uh, this young elephant. And we're going to head over there and see what he's found.
Right, Brilliant. let's go see what Brandon's found for us.
quite exciting stuff. Uh, we haven't seen uh, Changisa in some time now. <laughs> Fantastic. And, and she's looking so well. She's got a nice full stomach. Yeah. So yeah, it's been. Oh, it's been some time now that we haven't been able to find her. And I think since she's lost her cub, she's come back north again. Um, but as you can see, as only Tangisa can do, lie in a tree and look so majestic like that in the late afternoon light. So today has been such a special day because we've been tracking all day, working on Basile's tracks. We actually had line tracks that have crossed east. We've been working um, tirelessly and finally all our hard work has come together now. Um, I wonder who the, is, it, is it binoculars there? Many of you, yeah, many of you, many of you folks will, will ask us, well, how do you know it's Tlangisa and, and just being able to identify in a tree like it? I mean, all leopards or female leopards look fairly similar. And, and one of the distinct things with Tlangisa is she's got a scar on her nose and very distinct spot patterns. We're up in the north of the river now. She's generally moved back to sort of her old territory. Um, she was south of the river, um, very far south when she had her cubs. And now she seems to have moved back north now since she sadly lost both her cubs. Um, but the good thing is she's looking incredibly healthy. She's got a very nice full stomach, um, which is always very good signs. And always to see a leopard up in a tree like this is such a magical experience. Let's spot that one on the left there. We saw a little bit earlier a few questions about who Basile's mother was, etc. So Tlangisa is, is the mother of Basile, and Basile's sister is Cocavela, both now territorial females that have both had youngsters and both seem to be doing very well in their territories are south of the river, um, and mom now seems to have moved back north of the river. Even though that she's lost her cubs, there's a very good chance that she's been mating again already, and a very good chance that she's pregnant again. We mentioned in our previous episodes about the, the nomadic males in the area at the moment as well as the, the day one um, issue. So hopefully she'll settle up here again under a dominant male, most likely the Ravenscourt male, and be able to have cubs again and be comfortable without having any issues of nomadic males. She was successful with her last cub in this northern area, wasn't she? Yes, yeah, her whole life she was born around the lodge in that. And moving north, she settled and found a territory and was very successful when the Homelite male was dominant up here. Now that the Homelite male is gone and Ravenscourt's taken over such a large area, I think this is starting to cause a bit of issues for her, purely because his territory is so large. And that leaves room for young nomadic males or old males that are still alive and in the area mm. that will behave instinctively and, and kill the cubs. Mm. But nonetheless, this is the icing on the cake for us today. Yeah, incredible. Question for you guys um, regarding Tlangisa. Is she one of Maquela's descendants? Yes, she is. Her, her mother, Maquela is her grandmother. Um, so yes, she would be part of that bloodline. And she was born in and around the lodge. And then we've got guests noticing that she seems to be breathing heavily. And what would the reason be for that? Mm, nice full stomach, huh? During the digestive process, it's going to heat them up quite a bit. Um, you know, metabolizing all that meat, uh, it's quite a lot to process. So their body temperature will rise slightly, they'll have to pant. And, you know, of course, with that big full stomach, it's also putting a lot of pressure on their lungs. So, uh, you know, short, heavy breaths. Sure, this is 
a great, uh, <laughs> great way to end it off, eh? Fantastic. Yeah, I think what's so rewarding with the, the whole teamwork aspect is all of us working to a common goal and putting information together, working on tracks. You know, that's what we're looking forward to the most when, we, when we're all back as a full team. For now, we, we're making the most of it and working well and being able to share sightings like this with you folks at home. Very comfortable. Yeah, it actually looks very, very comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> you possibly find that when she finished her kill, she would have drunk water, climbing up a tree like this to rest during the day perfect spot to be nice and safe she's got a good viewing point it's not on the ground to be in any danger of lions or hyenas and there's a chance that after nightfall she will possibly come down the tree and start patrolling territory again um, one of those signs that we know if she'll start yawning or stretching a yawning with cats is generally your first sign that they're going to be active um, but i think with a full belly like this maybe for now she's just very comfortable perhaps after sunset at night when they generally are more active There'll be a chance she'll come down and start uh, patrolling territory. This is another question regarding her own offspring, whether Cocovella and Basilo are her only successful litter so far. Successful in that, yes, the adulthood and um, have their own offspring, yes. Um, she's had two other females that got to independence and left her and sadly were the one we know for a fact that was killed by another uh, male leopard and the other female, she was seen down in the south but possibly moved out of the area. So in the time that we've known her, Basile and Cocavella have been the most successful and the other female... Um, is, is successful, but not particularly in this area, but she's moved up north and possibly settled up there. I don't know if you folks can hear the birds, if you can hear what they're doing now since they've spotted the leopard. Quite a lot of uh, the crombeck, yeah. Yeah, a bit of crombeck. Yeah, it is good. A little crombeck going crazy. Um, yeah, so this is quite typical when they see in danger. It can be a small thing, of course, for a bird, or it could be a leopard. Uh, if we hear this, we, we never know really what it could be if it's a little bird along in, along in. It's worth an investigation though. I don't think I would have stopped if I heard those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and thought there was a leopard in this tree. But you never know. Uh, it's always good to investigate these alarm calls. It helps us also build a bit of a better picture, especially when you're tracking uh, predators. You can hear the, if you're getting fresh, perhaps maybe we're close by, we can hear these birds in the distance alarming. It might give us an idea. But it's always good to um, imprint on this because now the next time we hear these birds, we'll, we'll know there's something. But yeah, like I mentioned, it could be uh, it could be a mongoose, it could be a snake, an 
I'll, you know, I just never know. Could also be a leopard. Adult leopards this size will pay any attention to you know prey that small, but occasionally they do. But uh, not to say there that the leopard might not do anything. Of course, now it's very full. But um, there's been situations where we've seen leopards catch squirrels just quickly. Yeah, out of the blue. It just shows they how well they can survive. You know, from catching impala to catching fish to birds. Their adaptability and their opportunism is what makes them so successful. You know, you often, you very rarely see a really skinny leopard unless it's injured, but they'll find ways to survive, you know, mm. and from fish to franklins to birds to squirrels, they're incredibly adaptable hunters to survive. Birds have realized now that it's not going to do anything. Yeah. <laughs> Might be the best time to strike. Yeah. <laughs> All of a sudden, quiet. Some color in the distance there. Ah, sunlight. Yeah. Woodpecker, a bearded woodpecker, and drumming, yeah, the territorial tapping. Well, that was a fantastic uh, little ending to our Topher Safari this, this afternoon. Absolutely amazing. Two leopards in an hour is incredible, and Ellie's uh, it's been wonderful. It's been very, very successful. Folks, um, so yeah, come to that time. I think we, we're going to say our goodbyes. Um, thanks for joining us once again, and yeah, we look forward to seeing you all again in a week's time. Take care. Cheers folks, hope you had a wonderful afternoon, we had so much fun and the Kandisa as a finish has made us incredibly happy. Enjoy the last little bit of the sunset and uh, stay safe, we'll see you next week.